Tree C. Tree C is my least favorite. What are these, enduring understandings? Yeah. Okay. The first part of it is just like really basic, probably stuff that you talked about in your first chemistry class that you took. How do we know when a chemical change is taking place? Color change. Color change. Uh, warm. Heat. Bubbles. Either getting hotter or getting colder. Bubbling. Production of a gas. Uh, change of state of matter. Not necessarily just a change of state of matter. That's irreversible. An irreversible change of state of matter. So a precipitation reaction. Yeah. Right? When we mix two aqueous solutions together and we make that solid precipitate, I can't easily unmake that precipitate. Right? Um, basically, all they're really talking about here that's new is saying we need to understand the difference between a chemical change and a physical change. We talked about this in Big Idea 2 because we had uh, one example where we, I think, was it ethanol was boiling? I think that was on one of our problem sets. It said when ethanol boils, energy is going into breaking carbon, 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 hydrogen, and carbon oxygen bonds. Is that true? We're breaking intermolecular forces. We're breaking hydrogen bonds between different ethanol molecules. So this is just saying we need to understand the difference between a chemical change and a physical change. A chemical change, you're going to break covalent bonds. Physical change, you're breaking intermolecular forces. That's the main difference. Okay. So on a macro, on a uh, macroscopic level, it's not very easy to do. Right. You might have some reaction and say, oh, there's some gas being produced, but if you're boiling something, aren't you producing gas? If I boil water, I see little bubbles, right? I see gas produced, but that's not actually a chemical change, that's a physical change. If we looked at it at a molecular level, we'd see H2Os in the water, we'd see H2Os in the steam that's coming off, right? So we'd know we're not breaking any covalent bonds, that's just a physical change. So if someone told you that they had like a substance, like a liquid substance, and then a breath, if you attack it, would you not be able to use like a solution or just plain water? If it burns? Well, not, no, so you would put it in the heater. Yeah. And then you put it back on, like on a hot thing. And from seeing that, would you be able to tell if it was just like a solution that had something dissolved in it? So you're going to heat it? Boil it? Yeah. Well, well it depends. If there's salt behind. dissolved in it, the salt's going to be left behind when the liquid boils away. But if it's a mixture of two liquids, like if it's, I mean, if you boil uh, vodka, can you tell it's a mixture? Not just by looking at it. Okay. If you looked at the properties, if you looked at the point at which it's boiling, the boiling point, it's not going to boil at 100 degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. Then you know that it has. All right, so basically that's all this is talking about, is understanding physical change versus a chemical change. A chemical change, we're breaking bonds. Physical change, we're breaking intermolecular forces. All right, 3C2, I think is poorly placed. Net changes in energy for a chemical reaction can be endothermic or exothermic. We're gonna do a whole big idea on that. Thermochemistry, coming up next, big idea four. So we're actually gonna save this all. I'm not gonna say anything about this right now. You just put a big note. All will be covered in Big Idea 4. <clears throat> 3C3, we got to get through though. Electrochemistry shows the interconversion between chemical and electrical energy in galvanic and electrolytic cells. Oh boy, some fancy words. What's an example of a galvanic cell? battery is a galvanic cell. What's happening in a battery is that chemical energy is being converted to electrical energy, right? There's a chemical reaction taking place inside of this battery in which the chemical energy is being converted into electrical energy. So the electrons that come out of one end of the battery are going to have more energy after they go through the battery 
So then when they go through your device, that energy can be used to power your device. Okay. What's an example of an electrochemical cell? Who's got an iPhone cable? Oh. You plug your iPhone into the wall, you're recharging the battery of your phone, right? We're converting electrical energy into chemical energy. That's called an electrolytic cell. So an electric, electrolytic cell is one where we have to put energy in to cause a chemical reaction to occur. A galvanic cell, we have a chemical reaction occurring that puts out electrical energy. So it's sort of analogous to endothermic and exothermic, right? Exothermic releases energy, endothermic takes in energy. Galvanic cells produce electrical energy, electrolytic cells consume electrical energy. All right, Lindsay, read A for them. Electrochemistry uh, encompasses the study of redox reactions that occur within electrochemical cells. The reactions either generate electrical current in the galvanic cells or are driven by an externally applied electrical potential in electrolytic cells. Visual representations of galvanic and electrolytic cells are tools of analysis to identify where half reactions occur in the direction of current flow. Okay, so what we're going to work on is drawing representations of batteries or of recharging a battery essentially, right? Electrolytic cells where we're putting energy in to cause some chemical reaction. Now you guys, did I do this experiment for you guys? What? The copper and the silver nitrate? No. It was in that video. Now, if I had done that reaction in a very special way, I could have actually made it into a battery. I could have used basically the same chemicals that I used in that experiment to build a battery. But how? Where's my black marker? Well, I would have had to separate it. Instead of dumping everything into the same beaker, I would have had to use two separate beakers. What I did was I took copper metal and I put it into a solution of silver nitrate. But to build a battery, I have to separate those. I would have to put the copper into one beaker and the silver nitrate into another. All right. But I also need something else. I need a piece of metal in this silver nitrate. Okay. I'm just going to, for the sake of making this easy, I'm going to say I'm going to use a strip of silver. Okay. I also need a liquid in the beaker with the copper. And to make it easier, let's say we're using copper nitrate. Okay, so if I've taken a piece of metal, copper metal, put it into copper nitrate solution, a piece of silver, put it into silver nitrate solution, and connect them with a wire, we would be close to making a battery. There's one other thing we need, and I'll explain what it is in a minute. Okay? So what we need to be able to do is think about what reactions are happening in these two beakers. What is happening, or what could happen? Well, in this beaker we have silver metal and we have silver nitrate. So that's silver plus. Right. How can silver turn into silver plus? Loses an electron. Has to lose an electron. Losing an electron would be oxidation. Oxidation, right? Okay. We could have copper over here turning into copper two plus ions. How would it do that? Two electrons. Lose two electrons. Okay. So these are the possible things that could happen. But if these are both oxidations, are they both going to happen? No. No. One of them is going to have to happen in reverse, right? One of them is actually going to have to be a reduction so that we can have a redox reaction. How do we know which one is going to 
happen in the direction that's written? Well, we look at our table of half reactions. Okay, can we find copper turning into copper 2 plus? Well, no, because these are all written as reductions. So you're going to look for copper 2 plus gaining two electrons turning into copper. Anybody see it? Where? Second column. Second column? It's actually this one. That one's copper 2 plus turning into copper plus. Oh. Yeah, it's hard with the lights. Okay. Copper 2 plus turning into copper is right up there. It has a cell potential here of 0 0.34 volts. How about the silver? Where's the silver one? Second one on that side? I can't see. That's 82 plus. There it is, down here. Ag plus plus electrons forms Ag, and it says the voltage is 0 0.80 volts. Okay. Now I think we talked about this before. We're going to have to reverse one of these, right? So that we have a redox. What happens to the voltage when we reverse them? Flip signs. The sign changes. And then when we add the two reactions, what do we do to the voltages? Um, we add them together as well, right? The question is, which one of these is going to be reversed? Copper. Copper, why? It takes less energy, or produces less energy. So if this voltage is the amount of energy that's produced, when we flip it, it's going to be the amount of energy consumed, right? If these are negative values, that means that this reaction is going to take energy away from the electrons that are going through the reaction, right? If I reverse the silver reaction, it's going to consume more energy here. We'd have a negative 0.8 than we would produce with the copper half reaction, right? That's not going to happen spontaneously. It's not just going to, you know, oh, I mix these chemicals together and somehow it's just going to start stealing energy from electrons, okay? This is a galvanic cell. We're trying to use these chemical reactions to generate electrical energy. So when we add these together, we want a positive value. Who's heard of a 9-volt battery before? Sure. Two people have heard of a 9-volt battery, for real? Mia, you never heard of a 9-volt battery? I don't know what it's going to be. Do you have a fat battery? Yeah. You guys have all seen one of these? Yeah. Okay. I don't know if it's called a 9 volt battery. Really? No. You call it the square fat battery? Don't they have, don't they have letters to go with them? Like 9 and a V? <laughs> I don't know. Like, you know how, like, I've never heard of this. Like A, double A, triple A. Yes, this is a triple A battery. And there's also, like, they call them, like, some of them, some of the brands, like, there's, like, Andrew. But, like, no. those kind Nobody of calls this anything but a 9 volt battery ever. Those okay. kind of batteries are more like that. Okay, so, regardless. If you've heard of a 9-volt battery, okay. Has anybody ever heard of a negative 9-volt battery? Negative. No. That would be a terrible battery, right? Ooh, I'm going to power my device, and I put this thing in, and it steals 9 volts? That's terrible, right? Batteries, we want to produce energy. So the same thing here. If I'm trying to make a battery, when I add these two together, I better get a positive value. Okay? So that means we're actually going to reverse the copper one. So this one is going to undergo oxidation, and now our cell potential is going to be negative 0 0.34 volts. So if this wasn't a battery and we had to like decide which one to switch? So if we were operating an electrolytic cell, then we know we actually want it to be negative. Because okay. electrolytic cells, we have to put energy in from an external source to make the chemical reaction. So yeah, that's the only difference. Galvanic cells need a positive voltage. Electrolytic cells need a negative voltage. Okay. Now the other, we're going to have another problem here that we're losing two electrons here. We're only gaining one here. So we just multiply it by two. Two Ag pluses plus two electrons yields two Ag. If I double it, what's the new potential? 
1.8, right? We're going to double the amount of energy that comes out, but we're also doubling the amount of electrons that are required. So the ratio of joules per coulomb energy per amount of charges is still going to be 0.8 volts. Okay, so now we can add them together. We see copper plus two Ag pluses equals two Cu, or sorry, one Cu two plus and two Ags. Okay, the electrons are going to cancel two on each side. What's the voltage of the battery going to be? 0.46. You just add them up. All right. Possibly. But now we're going to do it in a slightly different way. Now we're trying to make a battery out of it. So one of the things we have to be able to do is think about how is this battery going to operate. What's going to happen when I start to make this battery run? Well, we can see from the overall reaction that copper is going to start turning into copper 2 plus. Silver plus is going to start turning into silver metal. Okay. So the copper is turning into copper 2 plus. How does it do that? It loses electrons, right? Silver plus is turning into silver. How does it do that? By gaining electrons. So which way are electrons going to flow in the wire? Left, left to right or right to left? Can you say that again? Which way are electrons going to flow? Oh, right wire? to left. From the copper to no. the silver or from the silver to the copper? Because silver is losing electrons, so it's going to... No, copper is losing electrons. Oh. So from the copper to the silver. Yeah. Look at the half reactions. Copper is losing the electrons, silver is gaining them. Didn't you also just use like the like the equation we made the bottom one and just see like what's getting out to that and what's getting here? Yeah, I mean if you had this, you could see, well, okay, this is zero, this is plus two. How do I go from zero plus two? I have to lose electrons. So that means electrons are coming out of the wire here and they're going into the silver over there. Okay? Now, I said there was a problem with this battery. The problem with this battery is as it operates, we're going to be building up negative charges in here, right? What's going to happen to the new electrons that are going to try to come through if we have a whole bunch of negative charge on the right side beaker? They're going to get repelled, right? So we have to add one other component to this to sort of complete the circuit. What we add is called a salt bridge. like a bridge of salt that you walk over. It's some sort of device that has a bunch of mobile ions in it. So it can't actually be a solid piece of salt, but it has to be something that has some dissolved ions in there so that as we build up negative charges in here, positive charges can come out of the salt bridge here to balance that out. Okay, if we think about negative charged electrons going through here, we're going to have negative ions flowing in this way to replace those negative charges that are missing in this beaker. So, um, a common example, where are they? I'm going to find them. Um, a common example is to take a glass tube, a curved glass tube, and fill it with salt water. Put a little cotton ball on either end and just tip it upside down in your beaker. That'll work because the cotton is going to allow ions to flow but not like dump out the whole mixture, right? Okay, and so again, as negative charges start to build up in here, positive ions are going to flow out of this end of the salt bridge to balance those charges out. Since we're removing uh, negative charges from this beaker, we've got to replace those negative charges. So negative ions are going to come out of the salt bridge on that side. Another easy way to make a salt bridge lives in a lab drawer in Mr. Bowles' lab. SpongeBob Salt Bridge! 
does the sound of sponge over here? It's a pretty disgusting, is pretty salty? sad. Well, not yet. Okay. But what you could do is you could take a sponge, soak it in salt water solution. That'll do the same effect, right? It'll absorb enough of that salt water that you've got those ions. Then as needed, they're either going to flow out of one leg or the other into whatever maker you need to balance those charges out. Okay. There's still a third way, which is to use a cup, a porous cup, that allows ions to flow through. So you can actually have, instead of having two separate beakers, you can have one beaker, put a little solution in it, put some of this, this porous cup in that, and then pour a different solution inside the porous cup. So it's sort of like, instead of being two side-by-side -side beakers, it's a beaker within a beaker. <coughs> but you've still got the separated solutions, but ions can flow through the cup to balance out charge as needed. So those are the main ways that we balance out this buildup of charge from the electrons going through the wire. Okay? Now, another thing I need to say, there's a big nasty paragraph. I think it's C. D is the nasty one? There's a lot going on in D. And most of what happens in D, we don't really understand because we haven't done equilibrium. Okay, so really the th key things that I want you to understand right now about these batteries is the values that we calculated here, <coughs> those are only true if the battery is operated under standard conditions. Anybody ever take a, put a battery in a freezer? Anybody ever tried to use their phone after they've been walking around outside and it's 10 degrees turn, out? Yeah, when I go skiing it always turns off. Like Why does it turn off? Because the battery doesn't want to work. It's not that it doesn't want to, it doesn't have a nervous system. The battery does not produce as much voltage at colder temperatures. So eventually, if the battery gets too cold, the voltage drops and it can't power the phone anymore unless the phone turns off. Okay? If you look at that table of half reactions on the homework, it says 298 Kelvin. So that's room temperature. So if these voltages only apply to room temperature, they only apply to one atmosphere of pressure. And they only apply when the concentrations of the solutions are one molar. Okay, if you're not at one molar solutions, you're not necessarily going to get 0.46 molars. Mm -hmm. Question? No. Not yet. You're not going to have to calculate the new voltage. You used to have to. There's an equation called the Nernst equation that allows you to calculate what would the voltage be under concentrations that are not one molar. What you'll have to do is this. Let's think about what happens to these concentrations as the battery runs. Which one's going to go up? Which one's going to go down? Copper's going to go down. Copper's going to go down. Why do you say that? Electrons are flowing from left to right. What's happening inside the copper beaker? They're becoming copper two plus. Copper metal is turning into copper two plus. Oh, uh, so that one's going to go up. So this concentration is actually going to go up, right? Because we're going to keep adding more and more copper ions. In fact, this electrode is going to start to get broken down. Pieces of it are coming up as the copper turns into copper ions. This concentration. Go it's going to go down because silver ions are turning into silver solid. So actually, you're going to get deposits of extra metal sticking onto this electrode as the battery operates, and this concentration is going to go down. All right. This one's actually going to get eaten away. All right. Now the battery is going to go dead when this concentration gets too low. At some point, this is going to get too low, this is going to get too high, and the battery's like, forget it, I'm done. All right? But we know as a battery operates, its voltage gets lower and lower and lower and lower until eventually it goes to zero, right? So at some concentrations here, this one being lower, this one being higher, we'll get zero volts. Okay? But what that means is, if dead battery means this is low and this is high, 
we can actually produce a voltage even higher than 0.46 volts. We just have to be further from a dead battery than what we are right now, right? A dead battery should be low here and high here. Here we're equal. So if we want to make an even more powerful battery here, I can just crank this concentration up and bring this concentration down. That'll bring me further away, right? If you think about it, we need to make room for more copper ions to be produced in this reaction, right? So let's get rid of some of the copper. Let's make this less than one molar. Here, the more silver we have, the more we can deposit as silver metal, right? So we should get rid of this concept. We should add more and more of this, and we'll get more powerful battery. Okay? That's essentially what it's talking about in heat. Using a lot of the terms from the equilibrium unit, so it's not going to make a lot of sense. But basically, the key thing in D is that it says when we make a battery that's further from the dead battery condition than what we have normally, the standard battery, we're going to get a higher voltage. If we get closer to the dead battery condition, so let's say I make a battery with uh, 1.5 molar here and 0.5 molar here. Well, that's closer to dead battery, right? Dead battery, this should be very, very low. This should be very, very high. So if I'm closer to a dead battery than the standard cell, I'm going to get less than 0.46 volts. So these might correspond, I don't know, to 0.3 volts, right? Whereas if I put in 2 molar here and maybe 0.5 molar here, I might get 0.5 volts out of it because I'm actually further from a dead battery than what the standard cell is actually capturing. Okay, now I'm going to attempt to talk about F. We're not going to do G, uh, part E because we don't know about delta G. Delta G is something we're going to learn about in the thermodynamics unit. But basically in part F it says there is a way to do stoichiometry with batteries, right? This whole big idea is about stoichiometry. So how does stoichiometry apply to a battery? You need to figure out how much of the copper you need from the silver. Well, yeah, we, to do stoichiometry, we have to figure out how much of one substance we have. We can figure out how much of another substance we need, right? But in a battery, we don't really care. Like, does anybody look on the battery and this says, oh, it uh, contains 23 milligrams of copper? No. When you look on the battery, it says things like voltage. It says 1.5 volts. And this cheapo battery does not tell me the other thing that I would like is the milliamp hours. Have you ever heard of those? If you buy those battery packs that can charge your phone without being plugged in, you want the one with the most milliamp hours. Okay? Because basically, what we need to know is for our given battery, this thing produces 0.46 volts. What's a volt? Joule per coulomb. That's a joule per coulomb. What's a coulomb, though? Like the measure of charge, right? What's another measurement that you've learned about in physics that contains coulomb? Electrons. Coulombs per second. What are those? Uh, watts. Amps. Amps. Yes. There we go. One amp is a coulomb per second. That's the current, right? That's the amount of charge that's going through the system every second. So what we can actually do is if we know, say, um, let's say this battery, the one we're talking about over here, runs at 0 0.01 amps for six hours, how much silver will it deposit?
This is actually a stoichiometry problem. Instead of giving us a molarity and a volume, or a PV and a T for a gas, right, or grams for a solid, they're giving us a current and a time. Okay, but if we know that it's six hours, and we know what an hour is, 60 minutes. 60 minutes. And we know what a minute is? Uh, six second. 60 seconds. One minute, 60 seconds. Okay, now if we convert between hours and seconds, now we can actually use the current. Because 0 0.01 amps is 0 0.01 coulombs per second. So if we multiply by how many seconds this thing is running for, it'll tell us the number of coulombs. Okay? So 0. Oops, this way. 0 0.01 coulombs per one second, right? That's going to give us the total amount of coulombs, the total amount of charge. Now coulombs is not going to be useful. Because no chemist does stoichiometry in coulombs. Coulombs to moles. How do we do that? Oh, God. Nope, it's on your equation sheet. Oh. Get out your equation sheet so you can find it. <coughs> it's close to the bottom right on the back side where they remind us what a volt is. Yes, 96,485 coulombs per mole of electrons. So I can say 96,485 coulombs is one mole of electrons. We're not done yet. One mole of electrons. One mole of electrons to moles of copper. What are we trying? We're trying to go to silver, oh, though, right? Silver, silver. So let's look at the half reaction for silver. It says two moles of electrons it's two moles of silver. produce two moles of silver. And now, since we want the mass of silver, one mole of silver is, I think, 107.9. Okay. Now, that looks really, really nasty, right? It's a big, long, nasty conversion. Okay, but basically all I'm doing here is using current, time, and a unit conversion to get to moles of electrons. The current is telling us how much charge is flowing through the system in a given amount of time coulombs per second, right? If I multiply that by how many seconds I'm running the battery for, it's going to give me the amount of charge in coulombs. Then I just have to do a unit conversion to get from coulombs to moles of electrons. Now I'm in the units that my equation is in. My equations are all in moles, right? Mm -hmm. After that, it's normal stoichiometry. We're just using the mole ratio, but now we're going from electrons to a different substance, in this case silver, and then we're using the molar mass to get back to grams. All right? So on my shirt, I should have Battery Island. And I can get from Battery Island no, to Mole Island. No, you can do like, like a circuit in the battery, and then it shows you how to do it. Yeah. yeah. From Battery Island to Mole Island, how do we do that? We use current times time. In fact, they even give us that equation. Look on the very bottom left of the thermodynamics slash electrochemistry. It says I equals Q over T. So what we could have done is we could have said, well, we're running this thing at 0 0.01 amps. That's our current. We're running it for 7,000. How much? 7,200. That doesn't seem right. 60 times 60 is 3,600, isn't it? Yeah. Times six hours. Well, 21,600. How much? 21,600. Okay. So we're running this thing for. 21,600 seconds, we solve for Q, it's going to give us the number of coulombs. So we still have to convert coulombs to moles of electrons. What's I? I is the current. 
finds all those on your equation sheet. It says I is the current in amps, Q is the charge in coulomb, and T is the time in seconds. Get the same number if you do it both ways. It's the exact same work. Okay. One thing I forgot to mention about this battery uh, on your outline. Read B for me. Part B on the back page. So we've got these two little pieces of metal in my battery. Those are called electrodes. One of them is called the cathode, one of them is called the anode. They're telling us that anode is the name for the piece of metal where oxidation is occurring. Which one is oxidation occurring in? Copper. Yeah, copper. Loss of electrons is oxidation. Who's losing them? Copper. Copper. So here's my oxidation. So this is where oxidation is occurring, we call this the anode. Mm. Here we're gaining electrons, that's reduction. What happens, what anode, or sorry, what cathode. electrode does reduction occur at? Cathode. Cathode ray right. So wait, this is reduction. Reduction occurs at cathode. How do you remember that? Cathode ray tube. <coughs> cathode. There's a C in reduction. <laughs> Center. Is that a cat positive? Or positive? Yeah, the worst cat I ever drew in my life. That's a red cat. <laughs> reduction occurs at the cathode. Red cat. I should doesn't like that one. She's just shaking her head. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Red cat. Reduction occurs to the cat. Huh, right. so we should have drawn a uh, red cat on their Leo there so we can remember. That's a good one. All right. We got our that's big idea three. We're done. Woo! That's it? That's done with lectures. Oh. I'm just ready to go home.